Market Science Society. I welcome you all to this episode of the seminar by an eminent astronomer from the University of Massachusetts, USA, Dr. Salman. Before we start the proceedings, I request Mr. Ati to come and decide from the political.
the important questions in astronomy is that what makes these shapes, what, what makes these spiral galaxies look like this? And one of the things that we think is important is how stars form. Because in this picture alone, you are seeing around 100 billion stars. See, the reason why you don't see individual stars in here is because there are so many stars that the light has been blended in. It looks like whitish. So, galaxies are mostly made up of stars. And so if you want to understand about the properties of these galaxies, we have to understand how stars form in these galaxies. So that's what the talk is about. And right here, there are some reddish regions. These reddish regions are places where new stars are formed. These are particular new stars formed from gaseous clouds. I'm going to talk about this in a second. But these are signature regions where new stars are formed. So what I'm going to show you are techniques, or at least the technique that I have used in my work, to isolate these regions and to see where these new stars are formed. So let's start our journey about looking for these young stars. Now, <coughs> I mentioned about galaxies, giant group of stars. Now you may think that we have known for these galaxies forever. Actually, the concept of galaxies is relatively young. Up until the early 19th, early 20th century, people thought that the entire universe, entire universe was made up of just one galaxy, our own. Or let's put it the other way around, that the, our galaxy was the entire universe. And there was this big controversy about that. This, this is a picture of Edwin Hubble. Now we know him because of Hubble Space Telescope. But Edwin Hubble made big discoveries. And one of his discoveries was to show that our galaxy is one of many galaxies. Now, if you think about it, what is the problem of finding out whether our galaxy is the only one or there are other galaxies. And the problem is measuring distances. When you look up in the sky, you see it as a dome. But you see it in two dimensions. You cannot tell if what thing is in front and what thing is in the back. You don't know what distance is because all you see is just a sheet in two dimensions. But in actuality, there is depth. The reason why we don't see that is because the distances are really, really big. Okay, so that's a key thing. So in astronomy, one of the most difficult things and one of the most important things is to figure out distances to any object in the sky. Because you don't know if an object looks small because in actuality it's small, but simply because it's too far away. In order to figure that out, you need distances. Okay, Edward Hubble figured that out figuring out distances in it. And what they found was, initially they used to see these small fuzzy spiral patches. They used to call it spiral nebulae, spiral gaseous clouds, basically. But they didn't know if those spiral nebulae are close up to us and they are small, or they are very, very, very far away and they are very big. And what we found in the 1920s was that actually those are located very far away and they're located, uh, and they're very big. And of course, Hubble also discovered the expansion of the universe, and because he did so many things, uh, he named the telescope after him. He was also a boxer, by the way. He almost became like, you know, uh, a middleweight champion or something like that. But anyway, he chose to go for astronomy rather than professional boxing. Yes? Still, the motion still remains. How did you do it? How to find out that it gets to the laws of the problem? I mean, it would ask me, the problem is that we I can't really tell that the Dead Sea or the category means spell metal. They are small or they are very far away. Right. Right? So Hubble said that they are very large and they are far away. Right. But what made him think about this? Oh, okay. The, the reason for that was it's related to how you find how you uh, measure distances. So there is a particular star which is called a Cephi variable. The, 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 the way it works is that that star varies in a specific way. It gets brighter and it gets dimmer. It gets brighter and it gets dimmer. Okay, in a very periodic manner. There's physics behind that, how it does that. But the way, they, the, the way these stars go up in brightness and low 
they have a very specific brightest point. Very specific brightest point. In a way, you can you can think about it that if you know the voltage of a bulb, light bulb, if you know that this is a hundred watt bulb, if you know that, then all you have to do is to measure its apparent brightness, how bright it seems to us, and you can figure out how far away it is. These variable stars, these separate variables, we knew exactly what their voltage was from physics. All we had to do was to measure these in some other galaxy and figure out the distance. So you need to say that the variation in the brightness is somewhere related to the distance or on the side? The, it's related, it's we the side, know exactly. Side voltage. Just like the voltage of the, the side of the galaxy tells us that uh, how far, uh, I mean, how far or how big they are. So once then we know that how big they are, then we can figure out the distance. We know how bright, actual brightness of this star is. All we have to do is to measure whether it seems to us faint. That means that it must be very far away. Or it seems to us very bright. That means it's very close. And what Hubble found was that in a nearby galaxy, Andromeda galaxy, the dose were very faint. And that's how we measured the distance. So since we are talking about the Andromeda galaxy, this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, which is the nearest galaxy to our own. And the other important thing about this is that this is our galaxy. If we, if we could potentially take a picture of it, it would look something like this, roughly. Remember, we cannot take a picture of our own galaxy because we are in it. And we cannot leave our own galaxy. We are limited by it. So what we can do, that's where the importance comes in from, for studying other galaxies, that in order to understand our own galaxy, we have to look at outside and guess how our galaxy looks like. It's, it's in a way, it's like if you are confined to this room and you can never leave this room, how will you figure out what is the shape of how does your room looks like from outside? And one way to do that is to open up your blinds and look outside and figure out what the other rooms look like. And then guess, revert back and figure out how our room looks like from outside. The same way we have done by looking at different galaxies and trying to figure out, ah, our galaxy looks like this. Now, this is a spiral galaxy. And most of the stars, that we, the ones we see, are located actually in a disk. That's where most of the young stars form. Now, you see this, again, a very bright central part. And again, the reason why it is so bright where you cannot see individual stars is because there are so many stars over there in the central region that you do not resolve individual stars. They just wash out as a just a bright patch of the sky over here. You also see these dust regions. The, the, the reason why these dark parts over here, these dark, dark parts are not places where there aren't any stars, but in fact, these are places where there is a lot of dust in it. And this dust is absorbing light from behind. And our own galaxy has these dust places too. Now, in, in fact, in fact, it, it, during summertime, you see Milky Way, what we say, Gekashan, right in, on top of us. Now, Milky Way is our own galaxy, and we are looking through it. And, and if you go to a clear place, clear, like somewhere outside of Lahore, like if you go about 20, 30 miles outside of Lahore during summertime, you'll see Milky Way right above you, and you'll be able to see some of these dust patches in our own galaxy. Because some places you would see, you have a band of stars, but there'll be dark patches in between. Those are not places where there aren't any stars. These are places where there is dust in our own galaxy which is absorbing light from the stars behind. So you can see this type of thing uh, in our own galaxy also. <coughs> okay, so as I mentioned, that the galaxy is, is, is a relatively young phenomenon, not, not phenomena, but young discovery. So since we are giving a talk in Biochemistry department. So we talk about in the biology. What what do you do when you what 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 did a biologist did when they first started talking about plants and animals? If you don't know anything, you first start classifying. Just like botanists, first in order to understand things, first they would say, okay, well, how do plants look like? Okay, this plant is similar to this. Let's classify it as together, and we'll worry about how they are connected later on. In the same way, since galaxies were young, the first thing people did was to just classify them based on their shape, of how they look like. So here is, of course, how, because 
other, all the other things also. So he started looking at these galaxies. So he classified galaxies also. And here I'm going to talk about just the basic classification differences. We have galaxies that are elliptical in shape. These galaxies have stars distributed in an elliptical fashion or spherical fashion. They do not have that disk that I showed in the Andromeda galaxy, for example. In fact, these stars are, these galaxies are roundish in shape. Okay. Now remember the scale of things. Again, these galaxies are generally very big, much I mean, several thousands of light years across. Okay. These galaxies are huge. So remember, I mean the scale. I mean our solar system would be like just one tiny star in it, and you're talking looking at more than a hundred billion stars in each of these galaxies. So these are elliptical galaxies which have spherical distribution. And then you have spirals, just like Andromeda galaxy or like our own. So you have, like, you can see the difference between the two. So this is a galaxy, again, these, these uh, spiral galaxies are disk galaxies, but sometimes you see them in front. So this is a face on, this is a disk galaxy which you are seeing from the face on, like this. <coughs> and just like everything else in life, things don't fall in nicely in these classifications. So you have irregular galaxies. The ones that don't fall, that don't look either like ellipticals or spirals, we call them irregular. So this is a galaxy uh, with a large Magellanic cloud. Now, I'll just go back to this uh, diagram in a second. Now, within spiral galaxies, people can classify them further. And you have SAs, SBs, and SCs. That means spiral type A, spiral type B, and spiral type C. What's the difference? But the only difference is, and there are same, same things that I mean, don't worry about that. But, say, but the difference is, the central region, for example, is bigger in these galaxies, and it keeps on decreasing. The central region keeps on decreasing as you go from SAs to SCs. Another thing, the spiral arms, these are the arms. These are much tightly wound. These are coiled in SAs. If you go to SCs, they are wide open. Same thing here, wide open. These are, again, three different classifications. And Hubble just classified them without knowing what's going on. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, is just, I'm just setting up the stage here. What I'm going to talk about today are galaxies that are spiral galaxies, so SAs, SPs, and SCs. But primarily, SA types. And one of the reasons was that people initially thought that SA galaxies do not have much star formation going on today. You have this central region, the big central region. It's mostly made up of old stars. And previously, when people used to take pictures, photographs, people could not see beneath those. And the galaxy was surrounded, the central region was surrounded by old stars, so people thought that these galaxies only contain old stars. Nothing is going on today. However, so I work on those type of galaxies and try to see if there is star formation going on or not. Anyway, so I'm going to show you a little bit more pictures <coughs> about these SAs, SVs, and SCs. So this is a picture of an SA galaxy, and again you see the central bright region. It looks like more like an Andromeda galaxy. see a decrease of the central region. The spiral arms are slightly opening up. You have an SC, and then you have even an SC galaxy where the central region has almost disappeared, and you have these large spiral arms. Now, where do stars form? Now, this is a famous image. It was on the cover of Newsweek and all the other magazines. This was taken from Hubble Space Telescope. This is a star forming region in our own galaxy. What is this? What? Stars form out of hydrogen clouds, like clouds of hydrogen gas. These are clouds, pillars of hydrogen gas, and new stars are forming. Now, a lot of the times you would see that you would expect one star in a giant cloud. But what happens in actual life is that you have a giant cloud, and when stars start forming, they don't just form one star, but in fact, you form stars in a bunch. So you form a cluster of stars. Here, 
is a big, it was a big gas cloud, and there were different regions where new stars formed. These two, for example, are already stars that have already formed. They've already come out of that gas cloud. Their radiation has evaporated gases around them. They have cleared off the region around them. But now, there are new stars forming right at these edges. Right at these edges, there are new stars forming. And in fact, interestingly, the light from these stars, these are very bright stars, they emit a lot of ultraviolet radiation. A lot of light from these stars is actually evaporating gas around these stars. In fact, some of these stars will not become as big as they would have if they would have been growing by themselves. But now, the gas around them is being quickly photoevaporated or evaporated by the light from these stars. So a lot of these processes happen. Now, students, yes. You need to say that those stars that are formed earlier, they are bigger in size. They are being? They are bigger, larger in size. They are formed earlier. Yes. As to the yes. In, in, in this particular case. Yes. In this particular. What are these pillars? Uh, I mean, what is this dust made up of? Is it ionized or is it? Uh, the gas around here would be ionized. But uh, here, actually, these are molecular clouds, molecular hydrogen. I'm going to talk about ionized gas in a second, actually. In fact, the whole, or most of the talk will be on ionized gas. Sorry, we, what delimits the stock from this gas is uh, how these are delimited? We'll come back to it in a second. That's exactly where we are going. Let me just show you the pretty pictures first. Because these are pictures, again, this is another star forming region. This is the Orion Nebula. It will be coming up later. In December, in November, December, it's already visible. Actually, they're not. This is a gas-forming region again in our own galaxy, and you can think of these gas clouds as stellar nurseries. These are places where new stars are coming out, new stars are forming. Now, questions have been asked: How do these gas clouds form? Well, okay. Before that, just to make sure that the previous two images I showed were of star forming regions in our own galaxy. Just to make sure that these things happen in other galaxies also, this is a nearby galaxy called M33, Messier Object 33. And there is this tiny region here. Hubble Space Telescope looked at this and found again a gas cloud. And in the center, you have these stars, new stars. Now, first, let me tell you one limitation of all of this kind of work about star formation. And that is, we are limited to only detecting big stars. New stars that are big, we, are, we, are, we can detect only those stars. It's very, very, very difficult to detect small stars. It has to do with our detection techniques. We do not know how to detect small stars. So when I'm talking about star formation, you should remember I'm talking about really big stars that are formed not small stars. Now, how do you actually detect these stars in other galaxies? What is the technique we use? Well, this is a schematic of a gas cloud. So you have a big hydrogen cloud that is there. And right in the center, you have this new star that has just formed. Big star, again, big star that has just formed. Well, the temperature, the surface temperature of these big stars are roughly 10,000 degrees. Now, in comparison, our sun, which is a yellow star, the surface temperature of our sun is around 6,000 degrees. Now, if you put a 10,000 degree star, or, or higher, 10,000 degree star in a gas cloud, in a hydrogen cloud, it's going to ionize gas. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, it's all hydrogen. It's all hydrogen class. And hydrogen is the simplest atom. You have a proton, and you have an electron. But your electron is sitting in the ground state. That's what it likes to say. If you put in a 10,000 degree star, it's going to emit ultraviolet radiation. Its light will have enough energy to kick off electrons from the ground level up to infinity which we call ionization. That's what's happening around here. Right next to the star, the electrons have been kicked out from 
this happens. Now, electrons get kicked out, but they come back in. And from physics, we know that whenever electrons come back in, and they go from upper levels to lower levels. So this is the energy level diagram of hydrogen, the simplest diagram. Whenever electrons jump from upper level to lower level, they emit light. And what kind of light they emit depends on their jump. So here, they would emit radiation dependent on this level, 5 to 4. Here, they would emit radiation from level 2 to 1. What does that mean? This is all, it's irrelevant, except that whenever electrons goes through this thing, it also goes from level 3 to 2. Why is that important? Level 3 to 2 emits a particular photon, particular light, called hydrogen alpha or bomber alpha. It's not important, it doesn't matter what the name is, but it emits a particular light at a particular wavelength. And that wavelength is, is uh, 656 nanometers, or in angstroms, it's 65, 63 angstroms. What does that mean? That light is in red light. Whenever an electron jumps from level 3 to 2, it's going to emit this particular energy photon at 656 nanometers in the red part of the spectrum. That's all it says. As it turns out, since ionization happens over here, if you can isolate this light, this light can provide you a signature of young stars. Because young stars are the ones that are brighter than 10,000 10, degrees, or they have temperature greater than 10,000 degrees. And when you have that, it ionizes gas. And if you ionize this gas, electron will pass through level 3 to 2. If it passes through that, it will emit this red light. So all you have to do is to isolate that red light. And it will give you a new star zone. If I've confused you, just bear me one second. Let me give you another one. What we are trying to do, say for example, in this room, all of us are adults. And you go out and you want to figure out the noise of children. You want to isolate the noises of children. So you go out in the street where the noises are of adults, and children. In this room, you have the noise only of atoms. So you take a tape recorder, and not at this time because everybody is quiet, but when everybody is talking, you take, take a tape recorder and look at uh, and, and tape record the noise of the atoms. Then you go out on the street, and then you again tape record the noise of the street. The noise on the street would be of adults plus children. Right? Here you have the noise of the atoms. If you want to isolate the voices of children, what do you have to do? Subtract out the noise from here from the noise from adults plus children. Right? So you have in the, on the street you have adults plus children. Here you have just adults. If you subtract out this noise, you'll be left with just the noise of the children. Right? In the same way, what we try to do is the, the noise from all the stars, or the light from all the stars, contains the light from old stars plus new stars. And what we have to do is, if we can just measure the light of old stars, <coughs> what we'll have to do is just subtract them. And I'll show you how we do that. Now, of course, we do that in images. Fortunately, now we have, instead of pictures, but these are still pictures, but instead of photographic plates, we use something called charge coupled device, or CCD, digital images. They are the same things what is used in those new cameras, except that astronomers have been using those for about 25 years now, in the CCD. So what we can do is, we can use this same subtraction, the one that I mentioned just now, we can use that same subtraction and do this arithmetic on these images. With the digital images, you can do that. With photographs, with pictures, you cannot. But with digital images, you can do arithmetic with them. So this is a picture of old stars. This is a particular galaxy. This is just old stars. That particular light from level 3 to 2, hydrogen alpha or H alpha, is not included. This is just light from old stars. This is a galaxy. 
Now we apply a filter. We want to isolate light from at around 65, uh, at 656 nanometers, that particular red light, H alpha. We are trying to isolate that. But since we are out on the street, we have young stars, but we also have old stars. So if you look from the previous one, we have old stars. This is old plus young stars. And you can already see there are some new things that have popped up which weren't in the previous image. Again, old stars, old plus young stars. 